Hello. In looking at our learning targets for Unit 3, specifically the one on World War I, one of the most important components of that learning target is understanding what the consequences were of World War I. We've already discussed the Treaty of Versailles and the implications that had on Europe as a whole, and probably the strongest consequence has to be, of course, that really most historians would say that the Treaty of Versailles and the treatment of Germany after the war really sets up the beginning for World War II. One of the other things that the treaty does, and of course the war does, is you start to see the breakdown of certain really powerful European empires. Today what I want to look at is really the collapse of Russia as we knew it up to this point. The Russia that for centuries had been led by various czars, female, male, good and bad, and ultimately what happens when you have essentially the move to communism, which of course you and I are much more familiar with in the modern age. This PowerPoint uh, is not super long. It doesn't cover every aspect of the history, but it's a pretty good overview, and it should give you another consequence to write down in the learning target for World War I. So please do so after you hear the PowerPoint. The year is 1917. It's the spring of what has been a pretty long involvement in World War I for Russia, and things are not good. Things are so rough on the home front that you begin to have rather successful revolts break out throughout the countryside. March 8th, in case you don't know, happens to be International Women's Day. We don't seem to celebrate it quite as much in this country, but typically it has been a day for protest, um, maybe celebration depending on where you are, but it tends to be something that's celebrated more in um, certain Eastern European countries. To that end, March 8th of 1917, you have an International Women's Day parade that starts off basically as a parade and ends up being a protest in Russia. The women are protesting the harsh conditions on the home front, including the lack of basic necessities uh, like food. And of course, when you start to have loss of support on the home front, it's going to be hard for your country to maintain a, present, a presence rather on the battlefront. Four days later, the protest movements have grown to such a fervor that you have an exchange of power put in place. You have the establishment of a provisional government, which is basically a temporary government put in place in Russia. This is pushed by a group, groups of individuals known as Soviets. Now, most of us know Russia nowadays as the former Soviet Union, but the actual vocab word, the term Soviet, refers to a council of workers and soldiers. And what these Soviet groups pushed for was respect for not only workers, but also the poor, which, of course, you have a very large collection of poor people in Russia at this time. This protest that breaks out on March 12th, this provisional government, is not only led by the Soviet group, but also the peasantry. And as we know with revolutions, if you get the peasantry involved, you have quite a few numbers behind your movement and typically you can be successful if you can keep everything organized. Three days after this provisional government is put into place, the Tsar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas II, who was related to Queen Victoria of England and was also related to um, the current King of England at this time, George, they were actually George's his uncle, is forced to abdicate the throne in Russia. He no longer has control, he no longer has the support of the people of Russia, and he certainly does not have the support of his government or military. When he steps down, this ends 300 years of Romanov rule. He's from the Romanov family, and this is a rather significant change in Russian history. In the background, you see his family. Um, we certainly know the unfortunate tale of what happens to his family, they are basically, when they leave the palace, they aren't allowed to go into exile. Um, they unfortunately are basically put under house arrest, kind of in an area out in the countryside, so to speak, in Russia. And by July of 1918, so by the following, well, really a year or so after the fact, they will be assassinated. Now, many of you guys know the Disney story about Anastasia and all that. We really don't have much proof that his daughter survived for a time. Um, it's a pretty tragic tale. If you get a chance, you should look into it. Um, they're always uncovering details and whatnot. At any rate, it's unfortunate that they weren't able to leave, but certainly as revolutions occur, people fear that if a leader leaves, he can come back and overthrow the government. 
His biggest mistake was he was not a very good leader during World War One, and the huge losses that were being obtained on the battlefront, especially the loss of life, really is what ended Tsar Nicholas's rule, and unfortunately, ultimately, his life and the life of his family. By that April, you have a new power figure uh, coming into Russia, and that's Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin is leading a group known as the Bolsheviks, and they were a group that had actually existed in 1904 and 1905, and Lenin at that time had actually been put on a train and sent into exile. Um, in fact, the Germans actually had really contact with him, and it's reported that the Germans, in the midst of you know the end of World War I, put Vladimir Lenin on a train with his fellow disciples, if you will, and sent him back to Russia, purposely hoping that he would cause a revolution and cause Russia to get out of the war, which kind of worked, and that's basically what happened. Lenin was a very passionate speaker. He, like a lot of these guys that comes into power at this time, is telling the people what they want to hear. He's telling them there'll be change, and he is going to be fortunate enough to be able to back up his message. Whether that ends up being good for Russia in the end, of course, history is still playing that out. But at any rate, he's allowed to come back into power and to have a voice amongst the people. Lenin and his fellow Bolsheviks put together what's known as the April Theses, which really was a plan that they presented to the Russian people that mentioned that if they were put into power, what they were going to do was to withdraw Russia from the war. They wanted the Soviets or those worker councils to seize power and to be in charge of the government. They promoted the idea that all private land should be nationalized, which basically means that they would take all the land that was currently owned by individuals, and put it under the control of the government. Now, to you and I, in a capitalist society, that seems to be a pretty scary idea. But in Russia, because you had such huge disparity or widening gaps between the rich and the very, very poor, this is an appealing idea. Because now you're saying, oh, the land's going to be everyone's, we're all going to share, everyone's going to get a fair slice of it, and it's going to be awesome. Which, of course, in theory sounds good, but rarely ever, ever works out. The big motto that Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks kind of share throughout town is peace, land, and bread. And that's what they're promising people. Peace from World War I, land for everybody, and bread or food for everyone nationwide. By the summer of 1917, late June into early July, the last major Russian offensive in the war uh, against Germany has failed. At this point, they are not officially withdrawn from the war, but it's getting closer to that point. By mid-July, you have some attempted uprisings within the government once again. Um, you really, even though you have Vladimir Lenin and the Bolsheviks, you have a lot of other powers that are trying to come into play and trying to seize control. That's what is always dangerous in a country. and We see this all the time in modern history. If a major power is bumped out of office, you're going to have a struggle 